Hi everyone, my name is Niall Richard Murphy. You can reach me at nilm at sitereliabilityengineering.info or at nilm on Twitter. And I'm here to talk about the weaknesses of the SLO model. Now, like every model, there are assumptions and there are inbuilt uh, intentions behind the model, some of which can go awry or not map precisely to your problem or your situation that might invalidate the usefulness of SLOs. I think it's important to restate some of these before we go and explore some of the areas where I feel SLOs can occasionally fall short or, or fall short in particular situations. First of all, there are a read-write interface really between the business and production systems and a way to, to kind of collapse a lot of complexity into one number which really helps to drive org-wide understanding about the services, what should be done with them, how relatively important they are, and so on. Another assumption behind the model is that SLOs, these number, uh, uh, the numbers, the structures of the numbers, et cetera, model system behavior reasonably, both in declaring behavior about a system, we want this to be a two nines and this to be a five nines, and in assumptions about how you measure that behavior and what that measurement means. And a final assumption is that with SLOs, you can take action based on them. You can prioritize systems, relatively speaking, and you can use monitoring and alerting to uh, uh, with SLOs at the heart of, of how you do that. And you can also, I mean, kind of the point, improve reliability, particularly via the use of error budgets, uh, which is an assumption of the, or uh, an outflowing of the model at the heart of SLOs. Now, I just want to talk about a few weaknesses with respect to how we use SLOs to model systems or circumstances where this might be less, uh, less relevant. I think the first more or less generic thing to say is what, is, what is it with all of these nines already? Like, do we have any confidence that this numeric structure maps to any natural behavior or uh, any kind of ex explicit behavior on internal or cloud systems, et cetera? Uh, actually, we don't have any confidence. Like those, those nines, as I understand it, really flow from a, a historical approach from uh, the telco world about what is the appropriate measurement for reliability. Um, it, it is arbitrary, could be eights instead, 88.8. .8. Uh, percent available. Uh, I suppose the major thing I'd say there is if you have a infrastructure and you leave your system running on that infrastructure and it delivers some number which does not map precisely to a set of nines, there would be a question in my mind as to how wrong that would be. Uh, but anyway, I think the second thing to say is that SLOs and the numeric structure of SLOs really model services that have a lot of independent and kind of similar requests quite well. If you have neither of those things, or if you have particular situations where you have a hundred requests, but one of them is incredibly important, then SLOs don't really capture that, don't really allow you to wrestle with that complexity very well. And also if you've 10 requests a month, but they're all really important, or they all need to be processed, et cetera. Uh, SLOs are also maybe not the model for you. A working out or a, a kind of a consequence of that structure is the fact that there's only really a few SLO settings that allow for human response. We'll go into this in a, a bit more detail later on, uh, but that kind of necessarily limits what we as humans can do with respect to SLO defense. And finally, if we think about the major problems uh, from a reliability point of view that affect systems, tail risk, stuff that happens very, very rarely, but when it does happen, it's like very, very bad. The intention is to allow SLOs uh, or that SLOs allow for a graduated response to tail risk. Like it's not actually very graduated. We have up to 99.5%, uh, which is really the the end of the feasible human response curve. And after that, it's more or less automation. And the model is relatively silent on what kind of automation. A further point while we're talking about taking action based on SLOs, 
a further point about monitoring and alerting in this space is that there's no way to reasonably distinguish between 100 minute outage and 100 one minute outages uh, or 100 horse sized ducks or equivalent. The difficulty here is that depending on your service, right, there's, there's some nuance there, but overwhelmingly most services would choose 100 one minute outages if they were relatively uh, uncoordinated in time over and above the one times 100 minute outage, which could be like business busting for some people. The dual alerting architecture we have to try and compensate for this kind of thing is really a bit of a hack. It can be done. It does have <clears throat> some results, but it's it's certainly not an elegant way uh, of accommodating this reality. Coming back to the only a few SLO settings that allow the levels that allow for a human response, the difficulty here is that if the model is relatively silent about the automation that you're doing, then you really have no guidance about or no structure for figuring out, well, is it more important for me to automate this kind of response or this other kind of response? Uh, is a whack-a-mole style um, restart the box, uh, reboot the container approach better than a fundamental design, uh, redesign effort? There's, there's no real guidance in the model for that. And on the error budgets piece, we still don't really have a good a good way to respond to the fact that, as per the theory, if you have a really bad incident and you blow out your, uh, your budget, uh, that essentially prevents feature delivery for the rest of the year uh, or, you know, arbitrary length of time. That is not actually a, a, a good thing. We don't really have a way to respond to it. Most organizations just kind of magically reset the budget at quarterly boundaries anyway, kind of making a mockery of the model if it does actually work. So there's another point as well, which is that some organizations find that even when they do uh, experience a gigantic outage, they don't really have a, a good or coherent way uh, based on this model to take action to improve reliability, either for business reasons. Um, like actually we, we can't pause serving. Actually, we can't not work on the feature work. Like this is an existential question, et cetera, et cetera. Or for technical reasons, like there might actually be no canarying, no ability to roll back. And a much larger proportion of organizations are in this position than you would think. So the error budgets model is really not that useful for uh, an unfortunately large population. Thank you and good night.